But this morning we're concluding a three-part series in Isaiah chapter 6. We've been looking at verses 1 through 7 so far. I've been holding off on verse 8 for today. Now you can read ahead and know what verse 8 says, but there, there's, there's like a climactic moment that I want to get to in verse 8, and I've been saving it, pushing it off until the very last sermon of this series. But we've been looking at the holiness of God, that He is holy, holy, holy. That there's emphasis that is placed on the holiness of God, and we find that emphasis as it is extremely important as a revelation to ourselves as well. This morning, we're going to find that Isaiah has a very interesting response to the holiness of God, and it's the same response that we must have every single day. So we begin in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may we once again come to you with thanksgiving in our hearts. May we come to you grateful that in this moment we have your word in our midst. Lord, I pray that we do not take it for granted, as we often do, that we have your word spoken out by you that is living and breathing, that is fully inspired by your Holy Spirit given to man, and here it transcends time to meet us here, that we can be transformed by it, that we can be renewed by it, revived and restored. Lord, I pray that your word would breathe life into us, that it would give us a great calling upon our lives that you have given through the great commission, Lord, that we would go, that we would see your holiness here that described in your word, that it would come to alive in our minds and in our hearts, Lord, that we would be moved and transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. In this encounter, we are given a glimpse of the holiness of God. It's in verse 5 where we find Isaiah's response to this frightening scene. Remember last week I talked about how this would be terrible, meaning it would be a a fearsome moment, an awesome moment, that it is fear-inspiring and awe-inspiring, all in the same moment that it instills within a person that they were to be in the presence of God, that they would be stricken with fear with only one response, and that would be to fall on their knees or on their face. And Isaiah's response to this frightening scene For the presence of God is instilling that fear within him. It causes him to look within himself. And he gives words of a prophet to to himself, words of judgment and woe. And he says, woe is me. And of all the synonyms that would help us to understand what that word woe means, the one that I gravitate to is wretchedness. That he not only being exposed to the holiness of God and the righteousness of God in that moment, but is exposed to his own wretchedness. As if looking in a, in a mirror and he would see nothing but ugliness in that moment. So he speaks these words that a prophet would speak in words of judgment, and he speaks them against himself. Looking upon the throne of God, looking upon those angelic beings, and the majesty of the holiness of God suddenly Isaiah is reminded of something in particular. He proclaims that he is lost. A better better translation for that would be that he is undone. Unraveling at the seams, he is caught up in this revelation of, of the truth of his own estate, 
of his own well-being, of his own life, and to those to which he belongs, that nation that he belongs to as he looks out in this realization not only of his own wretchedness and his own uncleanliness, but the uncleanliness of those that he is a part of. He proclaims here that his lips are unclean, his lips. And also the lips of the nation of Israel is who he's speaking of. This hard-hitting truth is revealed because his eyes, as it says in verse 5, his eyes have seen the king. Now remember, we're not talking about Uzziah. He's dead. Now see, God is looking upon the throne of the eternal king, the sovereign one, Adonai, the Lord God. And his eyes have seen the king, and then he utters this, th- these words here that he is a man of unclean lips. Why the lips? Why, why is that where he turns to, of all the other body parts that he could have considered unclean, he speaks of his lips and the lips of a nation that he dwells amongst that are unclean? I mean, we've got this here as, as a clear revelation of human wretchedness. So the first thought that comes to my mind is the fact, ever-present fact, of sin. So could it be that Isaiah has spoken sin? And that's, that's what comes to mind. Sp- like coming forth from the lips, right? Words. We, we often need our lips in order to enunciate certain sounds. Have you guys ever played that game? There's a board game that's out where it's, it's got this mouthpiece that goes in your mouth and it causes your mouth to be wide oh, you're, you're like this. And you're trying to hurt a lot what you're trying to say. You can't say what you're trying to say. And everybody's trying to guess what you're trying to say. Well, it's hard not to use your lips when you speak. So when you speak words, you're using your lips in, in certain ways, in certain fashion, to make those sounds possible. The babies do that kind of thing. I'm sure Corbin will do it here in a little while. Using their lips in, in any way that they can to verbalize what they need, what we need. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty important responsibility that's then given to your lips. So is it possible that he has spoken sin? That the lips are the facilitator in the action of sinning? Was it something that he said that brought about this, this wretchedness? And so then I think of the commandments that are given to us. That the, I think about the Ten Commandments. When we go through all thousand of them, but maybe we just go to the ten that, that, that summarize the majority But I think about the Ten Commandments. One of the first ones that comes to mind is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Which we we like to translate it even simpler than that, than you shall not lie. But the actual translation is, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the quickest way of doing that is by using your words. By saying something against your neighbor that is not true. And it's usually done by word of mouth. So that makes me think then, yeah, there are sins that we commit because of our lips. And then I'm like, well, you know, committing adultery, well, that, well I don't think we're going to go that far on the, the, you know, within that, that surface level of it. I don't think that's what Isaiah is getting at at all. If we're, if we're going through those Ten Commandments, what is it about his lips? But then I realize when examining it and examining sin, It goes deeper to the heart of the problem, and that is the heart. Because when I think about something like, thou shall not murder, and then I go to Matthew, and I hear the words of Jesus, and he says that if you have hatred towards your brother, then you are judged equally as a murderer. That you have murdered your brother in your heart. And that doesn't have to be something that's verbalized. There could be hatred in, in someone's heart towards their brother and not even say anything about it. So then it must be a deeper thing. And I go deeper into the scriptures and I'm reminded of an encounter that Jesus has with the Pharisees. When the Pharisees are rebuking Jesus about the disciples not cleaning their hands before they eat, I'm like, come on. 
And then in response, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for, for what they are saying in, in, their, in their legalism. And you, you find this in Matthew 15, verses 17 through 19. If you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to. I can read it for you. It will not be on the screen. Like I said, all the backups are gone. But you, if you have a Bible there, it's Matthew 15, verses 17 through 19. And here's what Jesus says in response to this rebuke from the Pharisees. He says, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Wait, we're talking about this organ, the heart, and not the brain. I I thought thoughts came from the brain. But Jesus is getting at something so much deeper. Evil thoughts come from the heart. Murder comes from the heart. Adultery from the heart. Sexual immorality from the heart. Theft from the heart. False witness. Remember, thou shalt not bear false witness. Where does it come from, Jesus? From the heart. And slander. He, he's, he, there's a list of commandments. There's a list of sins here. And all of them coming forth from the heart and then out of the mouth. So the words that are coming through your lips come from the heart. So then the question is, what is in the heart? So we make this connection. It wasn't necessarily a matter of the lips, really. It was a matter of the heart. Because in that moment when Isaiah is given a glimpse and revelation of the holiness of God and his righteousness, seated upon his throne in all, in all sovereignty and authority over all things, his heart is ripped open, exposing everything from the inside out. And he cannot help but see his own wretchedness. He cannot help but see his own sin. And that's why he says... I'm a man of unclean lips. What he's doing is he is confessing that he is sinful man. And that the nation that he is associated with, that he comes from, is filled with sinful men and women. He is saying in this moment, I am a wretched sinner. But God does not leave Isaiah to wallow in this revelation of his own pity. He does not leave him there to wallow. But you turn and you look at verse 6. Isaiah 6, verse 6. And we see a beautiful scene of what happens in this moment of confession. What God does is he intervenes. He steps in. He doesn't leave Isaiah to be alone. There's an angel that moves. The seraphim moves. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. So he's seeing a sequence of events of things happening here. And what a frightening sight it would have been because Isaiah is already torn up. I mean, he's unraveling. He's undone. And then one of the angels begins moving And then comes toward him with a burning coal. And putting it to his mouth, we find in the next verse. But what's very important here that we note of is that the seraph did not move on its own accord. It wasn't the seraph looking down on Isaiah in pity and thinking, oh, I got to do something about this poor poor human being here. No. No. Because the seraph could not move unless God gave it the command to move. Trees do not sway unless God tells them to sway. Flowers do not grow unless God allows them to grow. And the wind does not blow in any unnecessary direction, but God commands it which way to go. All of creation bows to the will of of the Father. And then the angels, being created beings, 
Bow to the will of the Father. You can read in Psalm, I believe it's Psalm 103. I think it's verse 20 in Psalm 103 that says that even the angels listen and obey the word of God. Now, we don't have it written here that God gave a command for the angel to move. We don't have it at all that the Lord speaks until verse 8. All this time, it's been, it's been the angel speaking or Isaiah speaking. But according to Scripture, we would know that the seraph would not move unless God is directing it to move. Taking a burning coal from the altar. And in verse 7, we find what happens next. And he touched my mouth and said, so the angel now is speaking, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. I'm going to have to call up my ninth grade English teacher who screamed at me more than a thousand times that you do not end a sentence with a preposition. And I'm going to call her up and I'm going to say to her, angels end their sentences with prepositions. That's just a funny grammar joke for you guys. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And the angels touched that burning coal to the lips of Isaiah and proclaimed in that moment that guilt is taken away and that sin is... What just happened? That's incredible. That it was something that we would seem... I mean, that would hurt, would it not? I've never kissed coal. I don't plan on kissing burning coals. I don't know. I I would think that it would cause blistering. I don't want blisters on my lips. That would be awful. I wouldn't be able to eat. And obviously, i got to eat. Look how skinny I am. I feel like this would be terrifying even of itself that maybe there's a a white hot coal or maybe it's burning red, I don't know, coming toward his mouth. And what can you do? I mean, in this moment, can you, can you, can you, you can't shoo it away. If an angelic being is coming at you like this, you just go with it. And I, I don't, and I bet it didn't feel good. I mean, maybe this was the, the kind of coal that doesn't burn. It says it's a burning coal. Maybe it's like that bush that God was part of, you know, that burning bush that didn't go anywhere. I mean, it didn't burn away, but it was still there on fire. So maybe it's just that kind of heavenly fire. Don't get caught up in that. It, it seems so silly. Here, here's what happens. God intervenes. That's what happened. God stepped in. God moved in a miraculous way. And said, look, Isaiah, you can't remain in this. Because if Isaiah was going to stay there in the presence of God, he couldn't remain in his wretchedness. Because it it cannot exist around God. He cannot be in the presence of it. That that wretchedness that was there, God had to do something about it. And I hope you get a hint of where I'm going. I'll, I'll get there in a second. God had... To do something about it, Isaiah would not have been able to stay there in order to hear what was happening next, in order to get the commission that he was about to receive. So God stepped in and he intervened. And at this point, we find it with an angel, a seraph that is there, and the cleansing is the fire, which fire is used. It's very symbolic for refining or purifying uh, when you, you would find that when you, when you melt down metals, all of the impurities begin to come to the surface. And so when, when Isaiah is put in, into, the, into the, the refinery, in the presence of God, all those impurities were coming out to the surface. And in purification through fire, that, that coal touches the lips of Isaiah and the proclamation is made, That your guilt is gone and your sin is atoned for. It's paid for. Here's what all this means, not only for Isaiah, but also for us. For us, God intervened. He stepped in. He was not going to leave us in Wretchedness. For for Isaiah, it was an angel holding a burning coal from the altar, but for us, it was Jesus Christ holding three nails on the final altar. 
The fire was used to refine and purify Isaiah, yes, but the blood of the Lamb, oh. The blood of the Lamb of God was used to wash away our wretchedness. That we would be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Because in that moment, that burning coal was only enough for that moment. See, God can do anything that's impossible. He could have made it to where that sin was atoned for fully. But the blood of an ox, the blood of a bull, of a a sheep, of of a pigeon, whatever it would have been, atoned for only a momentary moment. And then they would have to give that blood up again. But... Like the words of the angel I read here and I say, Behold, the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And it doesn't have to be atoned for ever again because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was sufficient. The coal was enough for that moment. And here's what the the author of Hebrews says in chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ... Man, I love that. I love that, those words. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And that's what it's about Because we're going to transition now into another moment. We're going to transition now into verse 8. That that, that climactic moment that all of this is leading up to. That the author of Hebrews in chapter 9 is is telling us all about it. That the, the blood of the Lamb was given so that now we can serve the King. The living God. Isaiah served a king for a momentary time. In the year that King Uzziah died, we find that these things happen, that that the king died. The king died, and earthly kings die. But now we find that God is calling Isaiah to a higher calling in not serving an earthly king, though he would serve under an earthly king. But my eyes have seen the king, Isaiah says in verse 5. The living God. And all of this to lead to this moment in verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord. Adonai is now speaking. And here's what Adonai, God, says. Here's what the Sovereign One says to Isaiah. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. Done. That's what it all leads up to. That pivotal moment in Isaiah's life when he receives that calling. But he had to be exposed to his own wretchedness. He had to be exposed to his own sin. This isn't the only time we find something like this happening in Scripture. One of my favorite illustrations, I don't even have to go, I don't have to go outside of Scripture. It's an illustration that is used within Scripture. We go to John chapter 4, and in John chapter 4, Jesus finds himself growing weary. So he stops at Jacob's well, on a journey from, from Judea to Galilee, but they must go through Samaria. And Jesus finds himself weary. They stop at, he, he and the disciples stop at Jacob's well, and he tells the disciples, go on into the town, find some food. I will stay right here because Jesus was waiting for somebody. Because lo and behold, here comes this woman, a Samaritan woman. This woman comes to the well in the middle of the day with jars to fill up the jars with water. 
In the middle of the day, this wasn't something you did in the hottest part of the day. This is something that you did in the earliest part of the day when it was cooler. But here she was, and she was alone. Now, this wasn't a job that you did alone. This was a job that you would do with others. Usually, it was the job of the women to go to the well, to get water from the well. In the early parts of the day when it was cool, and you don't, you don't do it alone. You do it with a group. You don't want to be alone. Things happen on the road. So you go with a group, but here she was at the hottest part of the day. She was alone with her jars to gather water. And Jesus asks her for a drink that she would draw water for him. And she's perplexed, dumbfounded by the fact that he, a Jewish man, is speaking to her, a Samaritan woman. And in the midst of this, when he, he is saying to her, look, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water. And I would give you living water that quenches the soul. There's, throughout this encounter, Jesus says something to her about why don't you go fetch your husband? And she says, I have no husband. And he's like... Uh, you're right when you say that because the man you're living with is not your husband. And in that moment, that woman's sin is brought to the surface. But Jesus doesn't leave her in her own pity and sorrow of human wretchedness. Because in that moment, he says to her, look, there's coming a time you know, when it's not going to matter what mountain you're on to worship God. He, he's looking for those who are going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the time is now. And she's like, I know of the Messiah that is to come. I know. I've heard of Him. And right there in that moment, He says, I'm Him. I'm the one you're looking for. So what did she do in that revelation she left her jars at the well. She went back to her hometown and looked for anybody who would listen to her. Look, there's this guy. You got to come see this guy who has told me everything that there is to know of me. You've got to come. Because she had a revelation of the Messiah, the Christ the one who was promised and destined to come to take away the sins of the world. And her sin was exposed in that moment, but she left the world behind. She left her world behind, her cares, her responsibilities. She left the jars at the well. And she went back to tell as many people as she could that Jesus was there. And Isaiah had to do the same thing. That when his wretchedness was exposed and his sin was on the surface, who will go for us, God says. And it was finally then in that time and only then after that all of that happened that Isaiah could answer, here I am. I thought you were undone, Isaiah. Here I am. I thought you were, were falling on your face and on your knees in the wretchedness of sinful man. He says, here I am. How could it be that Isaiah goes from this state to this state where he is, he is nothing and then he is finally something? It's because God intervened. And now Isaiah can move. And now Isaiah can say, here I am. Send me. And church, you have been presented before God. In this very moment, he sees into all of our hearts. And there is nothing hidden from his sight. The response after looking upward to God, it must cause us to look inward. And only then, 
after we have seen our shortcomings, after seeing where we have fallen in the revelation of wretchedness and sin, we confess that I am nothing without God. And once we have looked inward to see our own sin and we have confessed our sin, God moves in a miraculous way. And here's the thing. He's already moved. It's already happened. The cleansing has already happened. It has been done and it was done through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then and only then, after receiving the gift of grace and yielding to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, can we serve the living God. Only then can we say, here I am. Send me. And he will. He will send you. And here's the thing, and here's, here's why I know it, is because in Matthew 28, there's a... There's a a heading in the scriptures that I have in, in this, the ESV, that calls the next portion of this, beginning in verse 8, going through the, the finishing portion of Isaiah 6, and it's called Isaiah's Commission. Because it is a calling that is given to Isaiah that he would go and speak to the people, those that have the unclean lips, right? Because, because Isaiah is now giving a call, and you step back to Isaiah chapter 1. I believe it's in verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 1 where it says, Look, your sin is like scarlet, but I, God speaking, I will wash it pure as snow. And that is what leads us into that calling that Jesus Christ, in, in some of the final words that he has with his disciples in Matthew 28, he tells them to go. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them the things that I have taught you, the commandments that I have given you. Only, only when we have presented with the holiness of God and our own wretchedness, confessing our sin and God intervening on our behalf, interposing the blood of Jesus Christ and His righteousness upon us, only then can we stand up and say, Here I am, send me.